I'm by any means geriatrician without borders, so uh, it's, a, it's a disclosure of my, uh, uh, of my uh, commercial relationship. Uh, so already in the title of my, uh, of my lecture, you have seen some keywords which are very le relevant for, um, for modern geriatrics, complex patients, uh, uh, complex older patients, multimorbidity, al also multidisciplinary approach to the problem. Just to remind you on the facts that we have already addressed several times during previous meetings and also uh, the past two days, we are facing uh, population, population aging across Europe. And uh, here in red is it indicated that in the close future, in the near future, by the year 2050, the number of citizens older than 65 years will be higher than those younger of 10 years. So it's a remarkable fact, and we are all facing uh, the same destiny from the professional point of view. So in, in that sense, it's also important to underline that with the uh, population aging, also the number of people in need of geriatric expertise, those who are uh, disabled, those who are comorbid, or even no, uh, those who are frail, uh, will increase. And that's, uh, that particular uh, triangle here, here that we see, so an overlap between these three entities, comorbidity, frailty, and disability, uh, uh, um, these people are uh, in particular a uh, group of interest that we are dealing with in our daily practice. In the, in the discussion uh, uh, of the previous session, the, the term of evidence-based medicine in geriatrics uh, came also forward. Uh, and uh, it is really important to, to strive uh, for, for evidence-based medicine in geriatric, in geriatric medicine, but uh, at the same time, at the moment, we have to admit that uh, evidence in many, in many domains of geriatric uh, medicine is still lacking. So when we address an older people with uh, multimorbidity, there are several questions that we have to ask. Uh, for example, with regard to clinical trials, uh, how many older people with multimorbidity are really included in, in, in that specific trials? Uh, what are really the intended outcomes of the trials? And are these uh, outcomes really applicable to older patients we are dealing uh, with in our daily practice? And also, uh, are there any clinically important variations in baseline factors that affect uh, intended outcome? Uh, Dr. Burazeri a moment ago uh, indicated how important it is uh, to standardize methodology in uh, research with regard to older population, and we, we are facing uh, that problem here also. So one of the most important questions uh, that we have to answer is uh, what is the time uh, uh, until benefit or harm when we are speaking about uh, pharmacotherapy in older population. So uh, the key question is, uh, uh, with regard to this topic, how to choose medication in patients with multimorbidity, older, older patients with multimorbidity, how to do it in an appropriate way, and uh, to which extent can we really rely on the existing evidence? I think one of the golden and of the most uh, important rules is still, first, do not harm. So. Uh, Moreover, the, the decision should be taken in that way that uh, the existing guideline can be taken into consideration if, if available, but that the treating physician should always, uh, I would say, uh, try to tailor uh, the applic applicability of that guideline in a population of frail older uh, people and to see um, which are the possible benefits and which are the possible harms of, of, the, of that same guideline. Uh, as I indicated, the evidence with regard to appropriate pharmacotherapy in uh, frail or multimorbid or disabled older people is rather scar scarce. So we have 
to, uh, I would say, to apply a pragmatic approach in our daily practice, which would allow really tailoring of the pharmacotherapy to the profile of the older person, of older patients. And in, in that sense, I would present here for your daily practice also, uh, a multi-step approach starting with screening. It's another important term that we have already mentioned in our previous discussion, screening or identification of subjects at risk of adverse drug reactions, and then uh, followed by uh, uh, medication review, and then relying on uh, uh, on tools, certain tools that we have available uh, in order to discriminate between appropriate in and inappropriate medication. And finally, our golden tool of a geriatrician is our comprehensive geriatric assessment, here applied in the, in the terms of uh, tailoring pharmacotherapy to the needs of uh, older frail patients. Very briefly, due to, to the limited time, I'm not going to go uh, into very detail, but with regard to the screening, I think I would, I would just uh, like to mention and to draw your attention to the fact that the number of drugs taken by the patient uh, indicates the severity of the risk. The higher the number of medication taken, the higher the risk of adverse drug reactions. We have proven it in, in two studies in which we were involved with our team uh, in, in a in a, I would say, international group of colleagues, and in both instruments which mutually differ in content with regard to variables included, you will see the number of drugs is related to the highest risk of adverse drug reactions. So you have so-called gerontonet risk score, and you have here uh, so-called Badri uh, model coming from uh, Brighton. Uh, uh, where also has been shown that the number of drugs is the most indicative of the risk of um, adverse drug reactions. The second step, once we identify the patients uh, under the risk of adverse drug reactions, and in daily practice, the majority, the great majority of our patients would be under such risk, the next step uh, will be medication review consisting of three steps. So, uh, schematically spoken, the first one is identification or reconciliation of the medication that the patient is really taking. So, checking the medication list and, is, and is seeing, controlling in reality whether the list is really uh, the most accurate information or possibly uh, the patient could take some medication which, which are not indicated on the list. Uh, one, this step uh, has been done. The second step is really, uh, an, and you can call it here also the first step identification, but you can also call it uh, alternatively uh, pharmacotherapy history uh, or anamnesis to, to use the Greek uh, word. And then uh, you have the second step is analysis of the problem. Once we are uh, sure uh, uh, which medication the patient is really taking, we are going into detail to analyze the medication list and to see which medication might be or could be potentially, um, uh, uh, could be potentially inappropriate. And as a, as a logical third step, we propose then uh, appropriate solutions tailored to the real profile and the need of the patient. So I think it's important to, uh, to remember this identification, analysis, and proposing the solution for potential problems. Here I'm going to be very brief about this. Uh, there exist more than 50 instruments in the literature with regard to assessment of the appropriateness of prescribing. What is important to say, from the didactic point of view, they can be divided in so-called explicit criteria. These are the lists that, uh, that caregivers can use, not, uh, not, not, not necessarily being a geriatrician, but also nurse and other care, care providers uh, can use this list as an indication uh, whether a certain drug is appropriate or not appropriate for the particular patient with a particular diagnosis. And that's very easy uh, and straightforward uh, uh, way. 
The second uh, possibility are so-called implicit or judgment-based instruments, uh, which imply a use of, uh, I would say, additional uh, uh, elements, additional information than only uh, than just um, a medication list and medical diagnosis. From the first part, from the first group, I would just underline two of, uh, of these tools, uh, namely uh, BEARS criteria coming from the US, uh, invented in the, in the early 90s and uh, several times updated so far, and, uh, and, and a European uh, counterpart coming from Ireland, from the University of Cork, and the group of Dennis O'Mahony uh, are so-called STOP-START criteria. You see the acronym. It's a very uh, well-chosen acronym. STOP are the medications that uh, should be, uh, I would say, avoided in certain circumstances, and START are medications that should be considered in uh, certain circumstances. Among uh, implicit instruments, I would draw your attention, would like to draw your attention to Medication Appropriateness Index. Uh, invented by Hanlon in uh, early 90s. Uh, in addition to what I've just mentioned, it's important to underline that as many information we have about the uh, uh, individual patient as uh, appropriate the, inf uh, the decision would be. So besides the diagnosis, besides the medication list, it is also important to, to know uh, I would say uh, what the, the expectations uh, and, uh, and life expectancy of this uh, very patient uh, of this very patient uh, are. And then, in that context of tailoring the therapy to the needs of the to the real needs of the patients, uh, there is also an important uh, aspect of deprescribing or stopping with prescribing, of decreasing uh, prescribing. Uh, it, is a, uh, it is an element that we are uh, facing since, uh, let's say, uh, 10 years uh, ago, and uh, in which actually the need of tailoring of the pharmacotherapy uh, to the real needs of the patients is very much underlined. And, uh, what are, I would say, the conditions to deprescribe in an appropriate way? Because it is not a blinded deprescribing, it is deprescribing in a judicious way. So we should know what the limitations of the available studies on drug use really are. We have to, as I indicated, uh, assess profoundly the priorities of the older person. We have to perform a comprehensive assessment of the older person. I'm coming back to that. And we have to use certain strategy to help deprescribing, and also to have certain attitude, attitudes, to be really critical uh, in, in, a, in a positive sense, and to analyze uh, very profoundly the condition of the patient, but also uh, his uh, medication list. And also know which are the barriers and the facilitators of deprescribing, and also undiagnosing. And, uh, and very old age. If we have a look into the evidence, because uh, uh, half an hour ago we, uh, we underlined the importance of the evidence even in this frail population, we can see that uh, this uh, uh, evidence is really limited with regard to the prescribing. Recently, uh, uh, a review of the literature uh, has been published and uh, only nine randomized controlled trials uh, have been uh, found with regard to deprescribing, and uh, what uh, were the conclusions of this, uh, of this uh, review paper, is that the current evidence is limited of from the methodological point of view, low quality, and the impact on clinical outcomes. We are interested in these outcomes, uh, such as drug-related problems, quality of life, mortality, hospital readmissions, falls and functional st status, for instance, is still unclear. It is important to, to know this. Several years ago, to, together with uh, my good colleague, Tisha van der Kamen from the Netherlands, we uh, undertook uh, by ourselves a review of the literature uh, with regard on uh, the impact of deprescribing on clinical outcomes. And we found also s not more than seven articles with regard to false cognition, uh, uh, two for cognition and two for end of life situation. What is the conclusion? 
little research ha has focused on drug cessation. It's obvious. Uh, available studies show the beneficial impact on cessation of psychotropic drugs, a very important class in terms of uh, misuse in older people. And also this, the impact of uh, cessation on false and cognitive, uh, cognitive status of, pa of the patient. There is also an important issue of drug withdrawal and deprescribing in the last phase of life in, in, in the setting of palliative care, uh, when uh, I would say the purpose of therapeutic purpose of certain drugs disappears and uh, when uh, all the drugs prescribed at that moment should be uh, critically reassessed. Now we are coming to uh, our comprehensive geriatric assessment, which is really the golden tool of each uh, geriatrician. And uh, in that sense, I think there are some really very straightforward questions which I'm going to project here for you. Uh, of course, you have uh, several tools to perform comprehensive geriatric assessment, but in daily practice, you can go forward with certain straightforward, robust question, questions. So what are the diagnoses? What are the medications that the patient is taking? Uh, are there any possible drug-drug interactions or even drug-disease interactions? But moreover, going into the aspect of comprehensive geriatric assessment, what is the functional status of the patient? Uh, is there any risk of falls, an important clinical outcome? Uh, is there any risk of delirium, of getting confused? Is the patient in need of, of palliative care? Is he in the, in the last uh, phase of his or her life? And also, not to be forgotten, cert certainly in, in certain parts of Europe uh, today, what is the social or economical situation of the patient? And can he or she afford uh, each and every medication which has been prescribed? to him on her. Also some aspect like sensorial limitations, visual or auditive, uh, uh, which might have impact on the compliance should be taken into consideration. So you see each and every physician uh, can ask this question, but in particular we as geriatrician, uh, geriatricians who come across these patients in our practice should be aware that these questions are really, uh, really uh, essential to be asked. What is the evidence with regard to uh, a comprehensive geriatric assessment? There is evidence that, uh, that the applying of comprehensive geriatric assessment in, in the related patient group can improve the quality of prescribing in that sense that also uh, uh, a reduction of up to 35% in the risk of serious adverse uh, drug reactions can be realized. And then uh, also, uh, consequently, uh, might lead to uh, uh, some, uh, I would say, beneficial uh, health economical uh, outcomes as well. Our good colleague from, from Israel, Doron uh, Garfinkel, together with another colleague, Di Mangin from, uh, from Canada, uh, they published several years ago so-called GPGP algorithm, uh, Good Palliative Geriatric Practice. Uh, a very straightforward algorithm. I'm not going into each and every detail, but uh, just to explain that a critical analysis of each and every drug which the patient is taking is really necessary in terms of is there uh, really a proven indication for that drug? Is there a proven efficacy of that drug for, the, for that very indication? Uh, are there any possible adverse drug reactions that might uh, take place with that uh, very drug? Uh, are there any adverse symptoms that may be related to the drug in order to avoid so-called prescribing cascade? I'm giving here an example of uh, psychotropic drugs uh, which, can, uh, which can induce uh, par Parkinsonism. And if you don't recognize uh, the adverse drug reaction timely, you might indicate another drug, namely anti-Parkinsonian drug. So it is very important to be really critical to analyze each and every detail of, the, of the, each and every single patient. And also from the, uh, I would say, pharmacoeconomical point of view, you should think, are there any uh, better, cheaper, uh, simpler 
uh, alternatives. And if you say, okay, we have gone through all these questions and we, uh, we are pers persuaded that the, that the drug is appropriate, then we can continue with the same dosing rate in the, in the, in the related patient. If there is any problem uh, on one or another stage of this algorithm, then it's appropriate, then it's appropriate to reduce the, uh, the dosage or even to stop the drug. So uh, critical analysis is really inevitable. There has been a, a Cochrane review from Patterson and colleagues from several years ago in, with, with, a, with a, I would say, a, a large group of participants, more than 20,000, including 12 studies, uh, all addressing so-called complex multi-step and multifaceted interventions uh, in, uh, in older people, and which are the results uh, to, a certain, to a certain level encouraging, so the quality of prescribing improves, but uh, with regard to uh, quality of life, uh, for example, with regard to even uh, the prevalence of in or incidence of adverse drug reactions, uh, the results were not so, not so uh, satisfactory. We are coming to the end of the, of the talk, maybe to allow some space for questions or comments. Uh, with regard to the main conclusion, I, I can say that the most of the available research is so far with regard to this topic focused on interventions targeting either clinical or pharmacological factors, not very much taking into consideration of the complexity of the patient and also individual complexity of the patient. What, what is also necessary to imply in our daily practice, whether you are a geriatrician or a primary care physician or, or other organ specialist, I think it's necessary to take the assessment of the pharmacotherapy in the global assessment of the older patient, taking into consideration also life expectancy, but also the preferences of the patient, of the patient him or herself. So we are pleading for so-called integ integrative approach to the problem and in that sense, I can just briefly mention, we were involved recently in a, in a European project uh, involving six European uh, academic centers with regard uh, to development uh, of a software which was expected to provide an additional ad advice to non-geriatricians, organ specialists in treating uh, patients with geriatric profile. Uh, with regard to appropriate pharmacotherapy. And surprisingly enough, the software uh, didn't work in a satisfactory way due to a very low, a very low adherence of our colleagues, non-geriatricians, because of their standpoint, we can do it better, we know it all. So they didn't follow the advices of the software, so at the end, we, uh, we could not approve the impact of this software. On the other side, we were disappointed, of course, with the outcome of the, studi of the study, but we are, uh, we are uh, somehow even more convinced that uh, the uh, particular knowledge of geriatric medicine in the field of pharmacotherapy of frail older people is really essential, that not each and every one uh, can, I would say, plead to know every detail with regard to that aspect. And finally, we in the previous discussion mentioned all these terms. I have started with some keywords and I'm ending with some uh, keywords, collaborative care. And I think it's a nice closure of this meeting, promoting collaborative care between general practitioners, but you can add here uh, many other colleagues involved in older, uh, older patients' care. Clinical pharmacies in this particular context, inevitable, and also nurses patient him or herself, of course, and uh, preferably uh, supported by uh, electronic patient history with medication module in it, and also educational approaches, as we indicated a moment ago, educational approaches and research. And I'm ending here, and before really uh, uh, closing the presentation, I would uh, like to express my uh, sincere gratitude to the organizers of the meeting, because uh, on behalf of the UGMS, we were, we were here with several colleagues 
Professor Martin, uh, our, our current president, Professor Benetto's president-elect, several people among them, uh, Professor Cosioni, uh, uh, a member of the academic board, um, heavily involved in the discussions uh, about the preparation of the forthcoming meeting in Athens, which are really proceeding in an excellent way, as Fimbar was already indicating. But also, I was really, uh, I would say, uh, very enthusiastic about um, the meeting dedicated uh, to um, geriatric medicine in the Balkan countries. This afternoon, we had a very successful preparatory meeting, and you have seen the discussion during the last session. It was really very, not only very enthusiastic and vivid, but also very useful, I think, and as a first step for the, for the further achievements to come. So thank you again, and see you later. Okay, do we have some questions? Uh, maybe I can start with a comment. Uh, I think the geriatricians are really right persons to optimize uh, medical therapy in elderly people because it uh, reminds me we had some discussion this morning and you know, especially about the psychotropic dr drugs, uh, psychiatrists, of course, always gives five, six, seven, eight, whatever, a huge number of drugs. Then they, can, uh, then they go to GP. And uh, this is a lottery. One GP says, okay, throw this all five of them in the basket. You don't need them. Other GP says, well, you have to take all of them. The third one says, you can use this one. I don't know this one. <laughs> so this is a really a, a t terrible situation. Maybe it's not like that for the cardiovascular drugs, but <laughs> for psychotropic drugs, definitely. Most, most of those people, as we said about the level of education, uh, Dr. Budarmi said very, very nicely that uh, a lot of other uh, profiles of doctors should be educated more in the field of geriatry. So what do you think besides a computer-based um, strategies that you showed, do you have some other recommendations well, regarding I, medical optimization in those patients? I think there are several, I would say, uh, rules, uh, rough rules that we should rely on. First of all is the knowledge, sound knowledge of pharmacotherapy, of the prescribing physician. The second, I think, very important is the communication and uh, with the patient and involving the patient in the process of prescribing but also deprescribing. And to, just to take an example of psychotropic drugs in which I'm personally more involved, uh, there is a huge difference uh, between the situation when the patient is not informed for how long the drug is really indicated and the situation when you inform the patient about tentative stop date and tell him or her it is indicated for a short period just to assist you in a, I would say, in a difficult situation. Uh, to come over, but not uh, lifelong. And for many drugs, it is also important to know that to, to take the life course into consideration because the indication 20 years ago could have been okay, but it might, might change uh, uh, during the life course and when the death uh, approaches certain drugs are not relevant anymore. They can be appropriately prescribed a time ago, but they are by any means not relevant anymore. To take just a uh, example of statins, for example, in, in people who are, uh, who are bedridden and uh, deeply demented and uh, in the very last phase of their life. Thank you very much. Professor Benetos? Well, thank you very much, Mirko, for this uh, very nice presentation. And if we, um, two, two very short comments. The first one, we will talk about expertise l later, uh, earlier this morning, this afternoon. Well, I mean, this question about how to clean a prescription, yes. If we can do that, and if we can do only that, it's great, believe me. And in our education for the students, we do that, I mean, the stop and start criteria, the thing to take a prescription to say to the students, put be beside each medication, what is the supposed reason first? First step, we will eliminate some drugs, there is no any supposed. Then put the benefits risk ratios for each drug, mm. even if there is a, a reason. Maybe this reason for many psychotropics, for many cardiovascular medication, yeah. It's, it's something 20 years ago, or an education does not exist. Aspirin for uh, primary prevention, it's known now that it's uh, very, very important 
studies, but you have, we have to know science on that. And we have to work for with pharmacists. We have to work with pharmacologists. We have to work with the other specialists. We have to convince, and the, the example we gave, the, the negative results of this very big study, is the everyday life. We start, yes. I, you, I personally tell you, I have a good position, I'm professor and so on, and I try to stop some drugs, and six months later, the patient comes back with the same exactly aspirin, nitrates, advance of the azapines, because the physician say, oh my, oh, the, the GP said, oh no, no, but, well, it's, aspirin is good, what not, it's good. So this is very, very difficult, the everyday life, it's like, they, so if we can do that just, and to learn our students, our young colleagues, ourselves, the stop and stop criteria, and Gulistan, I don't respect my, I know, I have to work with, more with you, but, it's very important she does that in Turkey also in other So this is, I would like to insist on that. It's crucial. One more short comment and Dr. Petrovic and we close. Very, your, your opinion, you don't need to answer. Do you think then the randomized clinical trials on the patient with the several comorbidities, geriatric patient, which is not common nowadays, can give the answer already on the beginning of combinational polypragmasia and so you know so you already when giving the drug you already know what the risks are coming due to the appropriate trials you do i would say from, i know it's a company are very yeah, aversive I would, to this I would say from the scientific and research point of view definitely but on the other side we have uh, difficulties of course of uh, including uh, of people, older people with that profile in clinical trials. That's another limitation of the existing evidence. Uh, also from the ethical point of view, uh, we should discuss into detail, but the randomization, I think, uh, wouldn't be so easy in, in that population, but from theoretical point of view, I think uh, you have a point. It's uh, un as long as we perform really uh, such a scrutinous uh, research, we, we won't be able to answer all the questions with regard to that, uh, to that problem.